Hello, this is Harker Bean, and today we are going to be reading in Tales of the Automaton, The Verdict Apocalypse. This is a little side story based on that story that I actually didn't get to read when I was first reading the SCP-2785 document. If you like this video, please put a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. Now let's get right into this. Site 17 was in ruins. The once well kept grounds of the site were littered with debris and ash. Inside the site, tables were overturned, shattered glass was spread, and, and the containment cells were empty. The horrors they had once contained either succumbed to the flock of humans that now roamed the land, or had taken one look at what was now Earth and decided to leave immediately. The containment chambers that, were, that still worked were running on badly damaged emergency generators or was left of Site 17's power supply. Bob, as I like to call him, walked the halls of Site-17 as the emergency generators hummed in the background. It reminded him of bees. He remembered a uh, time bees tried to sing him for stealing their honey. But they didn't sing him because he was made of metal. It was sad because Bob didn't like hurting the bees. Now he'd never steal honey, because stealing was wrong. He found the gate to the site. It was now open. Locked shattered by the brute force of some other anomaly. Bob stepped through the door and into the open desert to look for new friends. Bob, after strenuous and completely random navigation through the desert, finally came upon a town. It was like an oasis in the middle of the desert. Bob saw buildings, roads, and most importantly of all, and most importantly, all sorts of new people to make friends with. After walking through the rusted town gates and entering the dusty, later filled streets, Bob looked around for people. It seemed that several were taking naps. Some were even taking naps in a weird red gooey liquid. But Bob only found one person who was awake. Bob felt excited as he approached a man. While he started on the right foot, he cleared his nonsense throat and tried to talk in a calm voice. <clears throat> Hello there, stranger, he said. Do you want to be friends? The man turned around with a blank expression on his face and screeched a little. After a burst of initial confusion, Bob realized that Screech sounded something like yes, and the confusion was immediately was instantly replaced with a great amount of excitement. In the first time in what seemed like forever, Bob had made a new friend. Hooray! Bob shouted with glee. Where would you like to go first, new friend? Hang on. Whew. The new friend started to trot slowly away, stepping around the larger or piles of litter. Bob followed with enthusiasm. After spending some time wandering around the dry, sandy city with his new friend, Bob figured that he was exercising. Bob decided he could stand to lose a few pounds and jog with them. He entered a jewelry shop. The window was broken open and there weren't any lights on inside. Are you going to buy some jewelry? Bob asked. The new friend didn't say anything as he entered the store. As he entered the store, Bob was dazzled by the array of gems and fanneries around him. Bob couldn't wait to try them on. Of course, this dazzling was damped by the scattered glass and litter in the shop, but Bob wasn't one to judge. Looking at his new friend, however, Bob had known that he didn't have any jewelry. Bob was made out of metal. He sparkled no matter what. However, his new friend didn't have a single sparkle to spare. It'd be a crime, no, an affront to basic decency, for Bob to leave his new friend without even one piece of jewelry. Bob walked over to one of the shattered display cases and took out a gray and white ring that he thought would match his new friend and his fashionably torn shirt. Then he walked over to his new friend and slid the ring onto his finger. Do you like it? he asked. His new friend squid a little in response and wet himself. Bob interpreted, interpreted this as a yes, and if he could have, he would have blushed. He just helped his new friend. Bob got to work. An hour later, his new friend, who Bob now called Krar, based upon his screeches, was looking shinier than ever. He wore ten shiny rings, five diamond necklaces, a crown to make him look like a, freak, like a king, jewel encrusted at sunglasses, and a golden, amazing chain around his neck. I think you look great! Bob said. Tell me that doesn't sound a little bit like the 12 Days of Christmas. 
Price screeched an affirmation and began to leave the shop. Suddenly, Bob felt that something wasn't right. He searched his memory, like a housekeeper frantically searching his house. That's why he found what he was looking for, the site director telling him the rules. Bob remembered. Alright, 2785, we've got a few rules around here. No fighting, no escaping, and no stealing. If you do any of these things, we'll have to take away some of your privileges. No stealing. We'll have to take away some of your privileges. The realization hit Bob like a baseball bat. He was stealing! And if he was caught for stealing, the site director would take away his privileges. He had to do something. Come back here, Cryer! Bob shouted while grinding at Cryer. Cryer, seeing a robot run directly at him, screeched and began to flee. Bob dashed after him in, in pursuit. Bob eventually chased Cryer out of town and into the burning hot desert. Fortunately, Bob didn't mind the heat. The chase continued past another, more dilapidated town around a range of monolithic mountains and into a tranquil a birchwood forest. The calls of animals were gone, replaced by, with, a sea, with a peaceful silence and a mechanical wheezing of Bob running at the loudly screeching in cry. Although Cry was somewhat weighed down by his jewelry, Bob had prioritized running in his latest transformation, and so they were about the same speed. After a few hours of zigzagging through the desert and wilderness, Cry began to slow down from exhaustion, and Bob caught him in a protective embrace. Cry screeched a little before her passing out. As Bob hoisted Cry in the fireman's carry, it thought on him that he had no idea where he was. He used to be in the desert, now he was in a forest. The birchwood trees remind him of those from his homeland. I didn't know, and, and want to worry about that now. No worries, he thought. I'll just look around and try to find things that look familiar. Bob looked up and saw the sun hanging over the sky. Eternal. Okay, too familiar. He looked lower and saw a snow-capped mountain. Bob didn't remember seeing a snow-capped mountain in, in, back in town. He also saw a skyscraper in the distance. It wasn't the fanciest skyscraper in the world, even from the distance. But I uh, could make out broken windows, dirty balconies, and dark brown ooze of disrepair seeping over the building. But looking at the skyscraper gave Bob an idea. What if I climb to the top and look for the city from there? It was a genius idea. Bob set off in the direction of the, of the tower. Frar in stow. After some time, Cry woke up and tried to squirm away from Bob, but not wanting a repeat of the gallery incident, Bob held him in the fireman's carry. Eventually, Bob found some twine that he was able to use as a leash, and he wrapped it around Cry's waist. It reminded Ed Bob of the dog that Dr. Jonas occasionally brought to the site. Bob wondered where that dog was now. Cry wondered where he, he could find the nearest seeds. Cry, after struggling, eventually became resigned to the leash and walked along with it's Bob. However, once the sun started going down, Cry became sluggish, and Bob decided he needed sleep. Bob found a heavy boulder or that he used to weigh down Cry's leash. He couldn't find a blanket, so he decided to improvise. He circled the flat plane and he had decided to sleep in and collected the leaves into a pile. Then he covered Cry with the pile of leaves and stuck a nut or a pile underneath his head to act as a pillow. Still worried about his warmth, Bob curled up next to Cry to keep him warm, using the heat from his core. Good night, Cry, said Ed Bob, giving him the closest thing to a good night kiss before pretending to fall asleep. Isn't Bob just sweet? Another day of walking through the empty forest passed, and the dilapidated town became slightly closer. Bob weighed on Cry's leash again and remembered what he once saw in the signals. Piled on some small twigs he found laying around and ignited them by grabbing two together. Sitting at the tiny campfire with his new friend, Bob felt a certain tranquility in the night. How are you today, Mr. Cryer? Bob asked. Cry squirted a little in response. Bob figured out that he was a man of few words. He still wore his jewelry. Which glittered in the night of the campfire, making Cry look like a disco ball. 
This was followed by an awkward silence. Hmm. Have you noticed that everybody seemed to go away? Christ said to break the silence. I haven't seen anybody except for you. And when I got out of Site 17, I didn't see... I didn't even see one of my old friends. Christ stared him with beady eyes, which Bob took to, as a signal to go on. It's just, I want to see more people. I was made to help people. I feel like if I can make just one person happier, then I'll be happy. I like seeing everybody smile. But you're the only one here, and I haven't seen you smile. Cry looked at him with his tight-lipped expression that he'd always looked at him with, still sort of staring at him with those beady eyes. Could you do me a favor and smile, please? Cry did nothing but screech a little. You know what, you're right, I'm ranting. Good night. Bob laid down with Cry, ignoring the pine cones and weeds and pretending to fall asleep. Hey, we got somebody. Agent Goley nudged Agent Gillison awake with a swing. He pointed at the security monitor, at what appeared to be a robot carrying a knocked out person covered in jewelry. Hold on, I recognize him, said Agent Golian as he pulled off the main list on his laptop. After typing in some keywords into a search engine, he loaded an SCP file. I remember, 2785, read Agent Golian, read Golison. Object class, Euclid. Let's call a Dr. Erhoigo, Goli said. The serene silence that Bob loved about the forest was suddenly shattered by a, a soft footprint crossing the leaves to crunch. He saw a group of seagulls walk out of the forest with very certain bird looks on their bird faces. They wore lab coats sized perfectly for seagulls, making them look like tiny scientists. Hello, said Bob. The seagull in front put, took out a pen and a sheet of paper, put the pen in its mouth, and began to write on it. Um, I can't read, said Bob. The seagull let, clutched his head with its wing in disappointment. But, uh, I can't read English, replied Ed Bob, struggling with the word. I can, uh, read the other language. One of the other seagulls steps forward and took the sheet of paper and wrote in the language that Bob could read, Russian. Hello, the seagull wrote. Can you read this? I can understand you, replied Bob. Do you want to be friends? Yes, replied the, the seagull, but we need your help. Oh, Bob said, feeling the excitement creeping in. What do you need help with? You probably haven't seen a lot of people in a while. We're looking for people all too. If you could... Yes, yes, yes! Replied Bob before they could even finish. One seagull looked at the other one. Where well, something in their obscure language and nodded. Good, wrote the seagull in front. Come with us to the tower. But what about Cry? Said Ed Bob, pointing to him, still following with the leash. The front seagull looked at the other one with a nervous look. We're going to have to leave him here, he wrote. I'm sorry, but we can't bring him to the site. I don't think you'll understand. There's so much we need to tell you, but if, but if we bring him to the site, it'll compromise everything we worked for. It's either him or us. Bob looked over to the seagulls. They wore neat lab coats and looked at them with focused eyes and had beaks instead of mouths. He tried to imagine one of the seagulls smiling, but his imagination was weak and he couldn't. He looked back to Cry, with his ruffled brown hair, beady eyes, and tight lipped mouth. He'd never seen him smile, but would he? Eventually? He looked at the seagulls and back to Cry. Bob had made a promise to the seagulls, but could he really leave Cry behind? After everything they'd been through? After some deliberation, he decided to make a choice. I'll come with you, he said to the seagulls while cutting Cry's leash off. It felt like Bob was cutting his own wires. Cry stood up, screeched one final time, and went off into the forest. Good, the front seagull wrote. Come with us to the site. It's in the tower up there. As he began to leave with the seagulls, 
Bob looked back to Cryer, the last friend that he might I'd ever make. He hadn't seen another human who wasn't asleep in his entire journey. Trying to shove the thoughts of Cryer deep, deep down inside of himself, Bob turned back around and continued to approach his fire. So, this is what the phrase, I'd probably go insane from the first interview with Bob, or SCP-28. Oh, crap. SCP-2785. I was saying. That phrase led to this story. Anyway... If you like this this video, please like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. I have no idea what I'm going to be doing tomorrow, so until then, goodbye!